Good evening. Thank you for joining this evening's GB Liberty podcast. Our show broadcast, as you know, every Wednesday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. And you can review our broad podcast on your Facebook page. You can put your comments and your questions in the comment section. I'm the host of the VV Liberty, John Moss. We are sponsored by the Tidewater Liberty Partners and the Virginia Beach Tea Party. And we're broadcasting from the facilities and thanking Senator Bill DeSteff here on uh, Lynn Haven Central Drive. All right, before we turn to our special guest, the Honorable Chris Taylor, the council member for District 8, I'm going to make a few announcements about upcoming shows and events that are important, so I don't forget. On Thursday, September 14th, 2023, at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., the Virginia Beach Tea Party is hosting Jim Gorham from the National Right to Work Foundation at the Princess Anne Masonic Lodge Number 25 at... 2849 Princess Anne Road. That's on the right-hand side going toward the complex. That's in the vicinity of the uh, golf course. On Saturday, September 16th, 2023, at 9 a.m., breakfast being served at 8.30 for those who want to have breakfast, the Tidewater Liberty Partners are hosting Mayor Dyer, Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Wilson, and myself, former Council Member John Moss, to talk about various city issues. At Mom's Kitchen at 3501 Holland Road. If you're southbound, it's just past Lowe's. Next Wednesday, August 30th, on the VB Liberty podcast, will be the city auditor, Lyndon Ramirez. And he'll be talking about a number of recent audits plus some other issues. So you think about the losing money at the convention center, losing money at the sportsplex, and the fact that the city has no methodology for determining return on investment for any of its partnerships. Very very interesting evening. And then on Wednesday, September the 6th, right after Labor Day, at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., my guest will be Virginia Beach School member at large, the Honorable Vicki Manning. So two great shows coming up and two great events coming up in the coming weeks. So now we have newly elected the first District 8 Councilman under our new system, Chris Taylor. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, John. I share with you in advance a little bit of topics I like to cover, but I'd like to give you a few minutes just to introduce yourself to the larger audience and maybe say a few things that are on your mind, and then we'll get back to some of the topics that I shared to you in advance. And then our producer, Robert K. Dean, about halfway through, we'll start posting questions that come from the audience, and then we'll wrap up promptly at eight so people can hustle home and listen to the uh, campaign debate or Tucker Uh, Carlson of their choice. How about that? For me, it'll be spending time with the kiddos. Well, there you go. That's probably the more productive, but over to you, Chris. All right. Well, uh, the Honorable John Moles, thank you for having me tonight um, on the show. Um, Excited to be here at the Virginia Beach Liberty. Uh, I've been getting a, a few phone calls for this appearance. Uh, some from the right, some from the left, not many in the middle. Um, but nonetheless, my name is Chris Taylor, uh, born and raised Virginia Beach native, um, sixth generation here uh, to reside in the Kings Grant Little Neck area, uh, attended public schools here in the city, uh, raised my family here in the city. Um, our family has a small business in the city, and now I have the honor of serving the city and so it's been a uh, quite a journey uh, for a local uh, and it's an honor to serve on the council as well as to sit with you today a um, few uh, lo- uh, hobbies I like to spend time with my family uh, six-year-old Caleb four-year-old Christian and baby Charlotte about 10 weeks old congratulations yeah. I loved your pictures on Facebook of your you and your family on their events I think uh, having a close family and doing it gives you the right perspective when you're sitting on the dais because there's a lot of young people in our city with families and that's another view absolutely and uh, to my wife kimberly for uh being supportive and and helpful on this journey uh so hi kimberly i I think she's probably watching tonight um but yeah i'm i'm um it's been seven months on on virginia city council it was a, a tough campaign um 11 grueling months with uh two other uh, candidates in the uh in the race and uh, we found a way to to get a win and uh, then you learn quickly that uh, you don't campaign anymore now it's time to govern 
and so we can, you know, I think we'll discuss some of the governing aspects tonight. I'm glad you I'm not You know what they the say, campaign. when you lose, you win, and when you win, you lose. All right. <laughs> so, but uh, to your, to your, uh, the, the, uh, those watching, uh, just thank you for having me as a guest tonight. Well, you've been good company. We've had the, for the people on the left and the people on the right, we've had uh, the police chief here. We've had people here like Chris Brown to talk about housing. So this is a uh, ideologically neutral show. We uh, this isn't like some shows you watch where it's a got ya. Mm. It's a, or five thousand people talking at once. That, you know, like you see on some of the TV shows. This is just a chance to let you ex share yourself and your views and take some questions from the audience. This uh, and so I thought since you've had some great folks and you know, I have had some you know private communications with you. I I don't make all my communications public. I just try to give uh, thoughts and insights that other people might uh, appreciate. But I do think people might be interested uh, about your latest vote on the festival, which I concurred with, but that's unimportant really, and the vote on the Amazon vote, which you were the lone, I've been there before, the mm -hmm. lone they vote, and I thought you might just like to share with the audience that your analytical thought process on those two votes okay well for the uh the most recent uh odyssey festival collaboration with ecsc um going in um i wasn't necessarily opposed until i started you know digging in doing a little research um and i was surprised to learn um that we had we had done a study of odyssey's collaboration with ecsc last year and that study uh, provided some insights, one of them being um, the uh, consultant found that there was really no robust economic impact uh, as a result of, of the concert. Uh, we discovered that for every dollar spent uh, for this specific concert, it returned a 35 cents investment. And in small business and our households, that would never be sustainable. <laughs> Um, and then furthermore, um, it indicated that um, roughly 73% of the people that attended would have still attended something at the beach. And so we really didn't bring in, you know, five, six, seven, eight thousand new people. Uh, we were really just, uh, I guess, gaining uh, visitors or attendees from the market already that was there. So, uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. So, um, for me, there, there was really no huge demand for that weekend. Um, we, we had MOCA, which I you know, articulated in, um, in my comments, the longest running uh, annual festival in the city of Virginia Beach, bringing roughly 200,000, 250,000 people to the market. And so, you know, did we really need an, another enhancement that weekend, more sprinkles? Um, I didn't think so, especially not at a cost of $750,000 uh, cash to the taxpayers and so <clears throat> my position was when you have a lack of planning uh, clearly some lack of communication or miscommunication between uh, the art boardwalk art show and uh, and the and the, you know the uh, promoter uh, that was a concern um, making sure that the events that we do select are the right ones on the right weekends when there may be actually be an opportunity to bring some guests in and I wasn't sure why we needed a 750,000 uh, plus up to the already roughly 11.7 million dollars in our advertising. Well I know the beach residents uh, appreciate your homework and I'm sure that uh, they'll be looking forward to the explanation of your peers and then there was the uh, vote um, which I watched this particular show from home that's pretty nice okay. you know, really great on the Amazon road and utilities, the $22 million subsidy mm. for the $17 an hour jobs. Maybe because you were the loan, uh, they vote on that, but that doesn't mean you're not right, but doesn't mean you are wrong. It just means you had a different reasoning as to how you looked at it. And I'm sure the public would like to hear your perspective on, on that take. Sure. And I, I like that approach uh, because, you know, I don't look at, you know, my colleagues, yes, vote is right, or, you know, it's not personal. For right. me, again, um, representing District 8, which uh, encompasses many a, a large portion of Shore Drive, 
um, being next to District 9, which Councilman John, <laughs> no, you, you're very familiar with 9. Um, there are major concerns in our city, major needs for infrastructure, and I was just taken back at um, our ability to cut certain road projects uh, in the budget process, but then, you know, three four weeks into the new fiscal year an economic development opportunity comes that requires significant investment uh, we we quite often hear about inflation and rising cost and so is the 22.5 million uh is that actually a accurate number or are we going to be looking at uh you know 10 20 percent cost overruns and as a uh someone that's responsible has a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens um i just couldn't digest that um that number. I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think uh, a constructive criticism that's gone from not just the current council, not just the past one, but in Virginia Beach that's relatively been cash flush since its history mm. is that often we find they find themselves making one of one decisions and they never go back and comprehensively look at all the unfunded and saying, where does this compete and where's the business case? So I think you, uh, I know the audience, now, I also like to know, what's the next step with Project Wayne? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if we've identified the next step. Um, we, I haven't personally heard back uh, from the client, uh, the potential applicant, and I know there was early on a, a value proposition of sense of urgency. We got to get this done or they're going to walk. Um, and so I haven't heard that they've walked. Um, but for me, again, that goes back to uh, the citizens. Uh, you know, I, I'm not opposed to looking at um, moving the green line. Uh, I'm not a supporter of a supporter of moving the green line. But if we were to look at uh, moving the green line and potential development, um, that's a separate issue to be dealt with. Then we have an economic development opportunity. We need to change the zoning. We need to rush through this process. We need to ignore the comprehensive plan and give them this last large parcel of, uh, of, uh, of our agricultural land. And so for me, um, I'm not sure where we're at, um, but I've already voiced some significant concerns, and I'm not sure the public really uh, desires uh, that, that project to come forth. Well, you brought up the comprehensive plan. And so since you mentioned comp plan, I thought I'd bring up a topic I'm familiar with. In advance of the bond referendum, the council unanimously adopted a resolution to garner the public support, which I think people were surprised when 72% of the people voted yes, mm. when every other bond referendum except going back to 1986 was uh, defeated significantly by the voters. Uh, so part of that resolution was that the comp plan, the comprehensive plan would be modified and amended to reflect that planning that plans or development would not contradict or otherwise undermine the investment that the public was making. Mm. Now, while I was on council twice by a closed vote at the time, six to five, they refused to modify the comp plan at that time. I know the planning commission has been hostile to be say the least. Mm. I know the comprehensive plan is currently now under review because of all of COVID and everything else. But I'm really asking, and I'm hearing, you know, I think we've got some questions from the public in advance sent to me that they'd like, is are you going to be an advocate for council to keep its word that it made to the public when it asked them to endorse borrowing $567.5 million? People feel like council's reneging on a promise they made. I realize you weren't on council, but it was council as a body mm -hmm. that made the promise. So, that I mean, that's a fair uh, question. It's a, it's a valid issue. Um, I've heard, you know, that city councils are, uh, make, oh, make sure I say this right, a continuous or continual body. Um, but that does, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's always accurate or that's what happens. There are, uh, for instance, we had the, uh, six, five vote for the special election versus, um, appointment. Uh, I think you were one of the six that supported that. No, no, you were, I uh, was one of the five, five. that voted against against not the, go back we voted for a referendum in august that okay. was jessica abbott i was one of the five that voted for that along with aaron jessica thank miss wooten and aaron okay then we had a vote in december 13th the last meeting that we had of the year 
to do this listening tour. Mm. I was one of the five votes that said, no, it wasn't necessary. The law is pretty clear. The judge is pretty clear. We don't have a choice. Okay. And then it came up again, and you were part of the five, mm-hmm. and the six people continued to listen. And then the lawyers told you probably what they told us in December. You can listen all you want, but there's no legal avenue to change 10-1. And then this summer they said it publicly, what they've said privately, and now everybody's in favor after we spent $400,000 to learn the yeah. obvious. So to your specific question, I think uh, to, to your specific question, we should honor our word. Um, there is uh, an investment when, it, when you talk about economic development, when you look at uh, building homes, and ultimately we always hear about collaboration and uh, when it comes to absorbing some of these costs to protect our environment and to prevent flooding, there's a seat at the table for the developers um, to absorb some of those costs. And so I know there are council members that don't believe that everyone understood uh, the language, uh, that there was some confusion um, and uh, a lack of clarity around what they were really voting on. Um, but I think ultimately the people spoke and we need to do our best to uh, keep our work well, my response was always, well, if you think there was confusion, then just uh, don't issue that debt mm. and uh, don't spend the money. Um, but anyway, that's a different story. I didn't know if you had any perspective. Um, and I know you've looked at those audit reports, but <coughs> what always comes to my mind when I look at an audit report is who knew what, when, and where. Mm. And on this, uh, put on the sports center, they went through two and a quarter million dollars before we, the council, were ever told that the reserve had been exhausted. And I think you, you know, probably. So how is it that someone was approving burning down the reserve? Who on the city side was approving that? And who's accountable for not telling you, because now the public looks to you as one of 11 people who's watching the farm, and Mm. then the pavilion likewise. So I... I know it must be very frustrating to you to have to answer questions when you you weren't informed in a time to act. So I guess the real thing is, what is council doing to make sure those lessons learned? What direction does the manager get from council as a body that you shouldn't be the last ones to know that we burned through two and a quarter million dollars of reserve and we're still another million dollars short? Mm -hmm. What direction, (laughs) how is that going to be better going forward? So I think uh, I, I lean on my background, corporate experience, um, working um, at a, a consultant practice, uh, learning and development, going into city governments, going into large corporations. Uh, and one of the things we always looked at when we first met with the client was, did they have a reactive culture or a proactive culture? Were they getting ahead of problems? or where they're trying to solve them once the problems kind of bubbled up. And so for me, I think the audit presentations that we receive are, are a good time to pause and review the information, uh, see where we're at. And so we received the audit of the sports center and we knew in February that they were missing uh, submission of reporting. Uh, we hadn't received some finances. And so that should have been um, you know, a red flag but again, when you have uh, five new members, when you have a new body, um, we're going into budget season, again, no blame. Um, but I think there is a responsibility uh, on behalf of, uh, of individual members to ask those questions. And if, there aren't, if, if we're not asking those questions, I'm not sure uh, with what's on the manager's plate, he's going to come to us and say, hey, you know what, um, this is going on here, this is going on here. And so that's why I've been trying, I've, I've attempted uh, to dig in and try to ask more specific questions because if in private business, if you're the banker and you have, uh, let's say, a, a client and they don't pay their note for six months, do you start calling them 30 days in, 60 days in, or do you wait till they go another eight months and then go, hey, what's going on? I need you to c- make up the rears that's not a good situation for the the lender or the lendee. And so I think we're in a position now where um, there has to be more collaboration. Um, The manager uh, does report to the council, but as you know, in your experience sitting on city council, if we're not giving direction or or putting pressure or asking specific questions, there is a tendency 
to just continue moving forward with all the other issues that we're dealing with. Well, that gets to the point of recycling, and this gets back to the sports center wants to renegotiate. You know, we have a contract for recycling. <clears throat> they posted a performance bond. It was a five-year contract. We've held them to that contract despite all the other issues because we could rely on the performance bond to get the job done. So we haven't been willing to renegotiate the contract at all, mm. which rightfully so. Mm -hmm. I think that's, but now someone else wants to be released from their requirement and not eat that million dollars. When I'm thinking, well, why are they, how are they different than recycling? Shouldn't they have either they, they can't eat it, then maybe we should get a different operator. I just sometimes think it's, you can always go to the taxpayers to be bailed out and that we never hold these people accountable like you would in the business. You would say, hey, mm -hmm. and you'd be looking to see who's being held accountable for the not not telling you you have a problem for it's expensive and makes the public looks like you're not doing your job, but you are, but you don't know what you don't know. Correct. And, and, uh, I, and, I, and I have empathy mm -hmm. for that. But, uh, but, but people should be held accountable who did know and then didn't tell you. But I just, I just throw that out as that because I know recycling is a is another issue that we. And in District Eight, I've heard loud and clear from residents. You know, they're willing to pay a little bit more. I don't think they they want to load up their Durango, load up the Tahoe, and take their trash to wherever. Uh, and so that brings up, you know, again, one of the surprises for me, and maybe I was a little naive, is you know that negotiation that business acumen piece it's not necessarily uh, a, a check mark in government not always but when people see it it's not universally across the city the person that lives in aragona village that gets an extra 10 bucks isn't the person in bay colony you're correct extra 10 bucks. absolutely <laughs> uh, and, and the so person that's driving the tahoe that's filling up their gas tank may not be the individual in another district that's putting 10 bucks in just to get to work or just put or put everything in the trash can and I think that's out. a very difficult, I posted on that, you've probably seen, that's yeah. a very difficult issue that takes a lot yeah. of knowledge. And, and do you mind if we pause here? Because oh, sure. it also relates to the labor force and collective bargaining is before us. And, you know, I'm not one to stand on, you know, the, uh, you know, on the stage and say, look at me. Um, but I went, I approached our manager uh, because, you know, many people know we had a, we had a baby in June. Uh, baby Charlotte came June 9th. Uh, we received a ton of gifts. We had to break down boxes, and my wife calls in to get the boxes picked up, and they say, we'll be there July 12th. This is June 10th, 11th, and so that's a month, and that was concerning, and I started hearing more from residents, from citizens with the same issues, and it really hadn't come to council, and I went to the manager and said, I think we have an issue, um, and our manager really he he didn't say we don't have an issue but it hadn't been brought to us and after a little digging in and further investigation that's when we learned that we had gone from 11 uh, vacancies for CDL to 26 I mean that's a that's a double digit jump it is. Um, and so these are the same when, when you talk about recycling we're losing CDL drivers not to Chesapeake not to Norfolk not to Portsmouth but to the private sector and again, if you start off at $16 an hour, the city of Virginia Beach driving a truck, or let's say some are less, some a little bit more, $16.50, I've said this, if it's my son or daughter, they can go to Wawa for $15.50 in the air condition. Yeah, but they can't get a defined benefit pension plan, and they can't get 100% of their health insurance and 85% of their family's insurance, 14 holidays, two days of annual leave, and 13 days of sick leave. But what's your Wawa. pool? What's your pool? that you're pulling from well my point is it may mean it's a time to use private sector to deliver the service fair enough because people don't value future benefits they value pay and we current pay especially if you're driving from portsmouth for that 1650 right. I, I, so i think sometimes when we have this benefit package <clears throat> it's attractive to people who are making bigger money correct when people who aren't it's not attractive because you can't spend a benefit yeah. at the grocery store. Yeah. And just for the the, uh, <laughs> the listeners' uh, knowledge, at Wawa they are pay they are giving benefits now. Not defined, benefit. not defined, <laughs> but you know there are again for that worker. Yep. it may be more valuable. I on, agree with you. you know, which we so. might want to go to a private sector provider of the service because given our benefit structure, we're not agile enough. Mm. 
to be responsive to get the employment that we need. Fair point. And if I can get my car, I can call someone to come pick up my stuff. I get a dumpster at my yard, mm. 300 bucks yep. for Load two weeks versus the $35 thing, which you can't hardly really put anything in. But, but nonetheless, everybody's different. But the point being is I think as we look at structural employment, as you're talking about, some of our agility isn't attractive to a worker who isn't looking for a big benefit package. They want to hire upfront wage, wage to take care of their both. family. Yeah. So well, it's, it is something I'm, looking to. I applaud you for looking at that because I think that uh, that's an important issue since labor is such a big part. But we don't always have to do the service ourselves. Yeah. And here's a it's an easy lift. Go out, stop a trash truck, stop a, a dump truck, stop a public utility truck, and just talk with them. And that's what I did for a month. And I started learning more about the people working for our city, realizing that for some of them, they're making a sacrifice for that 17 bucks an hour. Um, to drive from Portsmouth or Newport News or Hampton, but they have a young child and they are, uh, you know, trying to stabilize and get to that next place. And so they're willing for the short term to sacrifice, but I don't know if we can ask them to sacrifice for the long term. It's, it's, it's tough. And I think sometimes we'll be going to the private sector more to get <coughs> stuff done because it's a, they can do it at a higher wage as the employee, but a lower net cost. And I think we just, that's going to be true. Not for all jobs. Not for all. But or if you have a special service, then you might have to pay to get the service. Fair enough. And I wouldn't mind paying if I had to come pick them up today. I'd pick them up today. <laughs> uh, what were some of your uh, reflections on the retreat that just ended? So overall, I was pleased with the retreat. Uh, again, coming from my time uh, in the corporate uh, private sector, I did a lot of ret- a lot of uh, consultant engagements. Uh, you know, facilitator led. I liked the uh, the tone. I liked how the the facilitator didn't necessarily inject herself into the conversation. She allowed us to really have a discussion, which is much needed amongst the body to sometimes just stay on one item for 30 minutes is okay. Um, I'm not sure if we uh, clearly define our priorities uh, for staff, but we did identify priorities. Um, But in terms of that clear, maybe five or six things we're going to do, um, again, in the private sector, you'll hear me make that comparison. You leave a boardroom, you leave a meeting, there's an action item and, uh, they need to get done or it could be your job. Um, I am having to adjust to, uh, just so you know, that's not just the private sector. When I worked <laughs> for the submarine force meetings were for decisions, not for a lot of discussion. People did their homework before they came. I think it's legislative processes are, it's a different, everybody's an independent contractor. <laughs> so I'm trying to be patient. It's a little different, but I do have a question. I noticed yeah. that your number, the number, I don't know if it's number two, but a priority was affordable housing. Mm-hmm. And that's something, and I often think, what do you see as, when I look at the Fed raising interest rates, you know, so that mortgages go up to 8%, there isn't, what, what tools does the city have? It doesn't have any monetary tools. It doesn't have many physical policy tools that make a meaningful difference in housing prices. It has no monetary tools. Mm-hmm. So when we're looking at affordable housing and setting expectations, what tools do you see given the current fiscal climate and monetary policy at the national level that's setting interest rates? How do we offset that with anything that the tools that the city has? Yeah, and, and affordable housing, it depends, again, who, you, who are you talking to? When, housing when we talk being about less than 30 uh, percent well, of someone's median family the median family income so that's the definition of that, the, the affordable would housing use, what, uh, that the median now, in family eight, income for the median family but citywide yeah citywide when i'm speaking with individuals more so it's the uh, established family that has a young adult that is coming back to the area from college or uh, looking to work and and they're forced to live at home because they cannot afford uh, an apartment or it makes more sense f- for them to stay at home because for the same amount of space they're going to spend two or three thousand dollars a month so that is a uh, a component of affordability not by definition of affordable housing or when you look at uh, our aging population i took care of my great grandmother for uh, almost five years um we we went around looking at places we could uh, uh, have her reside, and it was this is in 2012, seven or eight thousand dollars a month for her to share a room. 
-hmm. And this was a 102 year old woman. She told me that's just not going to happen. And so it was cheaper to go into a community with some older stock and purchase a home, get her a nurse and a roommate to provide that uh, comfort for. Her. Now think about that when it's cheaper and that's, that's no longer it's cheaper to buy a home than to place her in affordable well, senior housing. I've been through that with my mom who's since passed. I had, I can totally empathize and, with your whole so, story. But so my point you, though is for the affordable piece, it's we need to kind of streamline what are we looking at? I think a land, I think a land trust could be something good because what I don't like um, is when we take city owned property and then we sell it to private developers at a loss or below market rate. So you've been in council, you've been in closed session, you've been in open session when it seems like when developers, not all, when individuals come to us, they want to buy below market rate. When they want to sell to us, we want to sell it 30% above appraisal rate. And so I think we have to make better decisions when you look at Laskin Road Annex. Uh, again, that was a school board piece, but why not collaborate with your city council? We could have purchased that property for $2 million, $2.5 million and then collaborate it with a multifamily developer to build affordable housing. There are those opportunities in our city uh, that we haven't taken advantage of in the past. I would couldn't agree more, and we have an agency that d in fact does that. The Virginia Beach Community Development Corporation actually owns 435 homes in Virginia Beach, townhouses and single family. Specific, more, more of them in, dish, in uh, Dr. Amelia Ross Hammond's district. Well, not all, but, but there's the some more in, in Aaron, Mrs. Rouse's district mm -hmm. as well. And uh, two veteran housing facilities they operate, one in Chesapeake, one in Virginia Beach. So I do think there's an agency, and I've often pushed that when we sold land around, why aren't we giving this land? And you probably heard me maybe on the Mike and Kerry show. We own the property. It used to be Circuit City. Mm -hmm. We talk about workforce housing for single people. Mm -hmm. That's very close to a lot of people working at, I'll call it lower end wages. Mm-hmm that that property maybe for workforce development has a higher value for workforce development than business development. And I think the pushback and challenge that I've heard, and uh, again, this is not a, tar a shot at anybody, um, but when you have uh, individuals that um, are a little bit more friendly with the development community, there's a narrative or a storyline that says that property is too valuable for workforce housing. It's too valuable it's too, to take care of our people who are our most important asset. <laughs> I don't, I don't buy it. I'm just sharing with you when people <laughs> look and say we have problems and we take money because people have a problem affording staying in their own home. Absolutely. Property taxes, mm -hmm. flood insurance, insurance. We have an affordable, HOA, affordable I mean, government on, on, issues, on. but, but in reality we have the ability just it's where the priorities are. I think you pointed yes. out well. I think we have the ability to help. So ourselves. I think two pieces of two low hanging fruit. And again, I may take you know some heat from the right. Is I think we need to do the land trust, stand it up with some money, and start taking on some opportunities to buy little pieces that we can develop. And then number two, we have a serious homelessness issue. Um, what are we doing? Uh, I think there's an opportunity to, um, you know, with with the aging, with the homeless, and then some that are just in need of housing uh, to provide some assistance. Well, I think if you package that with tax relief, tax rate relief, so people can afford to stay in their own home they already have, yeah. then I think it's a question of not that we can't, but it seems like we can do everything to spend money, but nothing to give money back when mm. we end up with budget surpluses and have overperforming revenues. So I think, I think people are just looking for private sector words we don't mind retained earnings but we're looking for a dividend too okay All right. so i think yeah. that's really the issue because i think you're always governing from the middle but people definitely feel like it's been take 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 surplus 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 and no no relief assistance no yeah. assistance to everybody robert do we have some questions from the audience you want to yeah. share yes, chris and i are just having a good time yeah here. thank you great. for having me oh it's great thank you for coming i would really be interested in councilman taylor's answer to how recent real estate tax increases due to increased assessments not rates affected local rental prices prices and home affordability so that's that's kind of a, a two-piece two-part so uh, for the the individual answer asking the question i spent time in, multi, in the multi-family industry and the challenge with rents is they're regulated by the owner 
property owner. So I've met residents that are in a situation where their landlord um, understands the challenges, uh, maybe has the property that there's some equity in paid off, and they make a choice to provide a fair rent. Um, I had someone reach out to me last week, a landlord that has 68 affordable housing units in our city. And because of the rise in that real estate tax rate, um, he's having to go up on his affordable housing. And it's frustrating him because he's trying to do something good. I've heard that. But ultimately, myself. and I asked him the question, I mean, you're well below market rate. I mean, you're, you know, 30 percent down, you know, from the two bedroom down the street. Uh, to the land, to the homeowners, um, depending on you know their employment status. Again, District Eight is made up of retirees, re- made up of you know millennials, made up of a lot of different individuals that own homes. So for some, I've heard, especially in the uh, minority community, that this is an opportunity for them to tap into equity they've never had, and that's a com- that is a side of the coin. So they're not complaining because it is giving them an ability to take out some equity, maybe pay for their child to go to school. I know my parents didn't have that ability to tap into equity in their home, so I have student loans. Um, And so it's a great question, um, but we have to look at the rate. Uh, We have to look at the policy, how we're coming up with that. And then I think it's the body has authority, or at least a voice, in stating to the manager, hey, if we're going to continue to see these types of increases, what options do we have because people are struggling people are going to the grocery store and their dollars going it's not going as far people are you know i we have back to school shopping this week i I have two a six and a four year old yeah and i just saw a show back school supplies were up 18 to 25 percent i mean pencils used to be uh, nickel you know pens book bags um so i feel i feel you for whoever's you know whoever's asking that question there are things we can do um, but ultimately, I think we have to get ahead of it and, and try to d- draft or craft policy that will bring relief. Well, I'm glad you said that because <clears throat> historically, I was unsuccessful. Most ex- most bodies, the governor, the president, a company, would give their corporate guidance, top line guidance, mm-hmm. right? That would govern. We we want to take risk in this area. We don't want to take risk in that area. We want to bring down. We want to hold our labor cost at no more than fifty percent of estimated revenues all these things guidance guidance as a body to the board might provide that to the ceo or the ceo mm-hmm. but council never comes together and votes on a budget resolution like the general assembly does or like mm. congress does so there isn't any body guidance there's only 11 people having 11 individual conversations so no one ever knows what everyone said except the manager i hope i wish you luck and driving to the goal of the council would provide upfront guidance. <laughs> and again, that goes so back to that cultural not. piece of it does. reactive versus proactive. And so, uh, so uh, no I'm blame game. Here and, no, no, I'm just saying <laughs> it's an opportunity we haven't used. Mm, okay, fair, that's fair. And I'm just saying I hope you exploit that. Another question, Robert. Yes, uh, my old stomping grounds, my last duty station, Marine Corps, was Charleston. Okay. Uh, what did you come back from that $700 a night uh, <laughs> trip? Uh, into Charleston. I know you didn't go. I did not. So I wanted. I did early on. I had. I. I thought I was going to go, and then yeah. again, it was a month before the baby came, and I. I said that might not be wise to go. Uh, you know, to the five star, uh, with Kim at home with the the two boys and and eight months pregnant. Um, I think again, uh, got a lot of pushback, but there is value in uh, regional collaboration in visiting different uh, uh, localities. But for me, you know, I was, I sit as a liaison to the housing advisory board and I was speaking with someone, Charleston had just been up here looking at what we're doing in some specific areas. And but so- did anyone look at the differences and lack of commonality between Charleston and Virginia Beach? I'm not gonna, no comment. <laughs> um, so did we have to send, uh, you know, as many people as we did? And, and that's a question, I think, when you look at when we get into this year's this year's budget, you know, is there some room to cut some fat in terms of travel? Because, again, in the private sector, I remember at DuPont uh, when when revenue was down, when we were off target, you would get notices saying we're cutting travel. 
if it's not necessary to close the deal, then make a phone call. And so um, I'm not going to tear into those that went to, to Charleston. Hopefully they brought something back. I haven't really got a, out, a, a, a great output report, um, but ultimately it's, it's money spent, it's done, and we got to push forward. Well, here's a question when we <clears throat> talked about uh, two years ago when we had used cars that were being driven up for reasons unrelated to wage growth or just historical perturbations to the price of used cars. We use that justification. I brought that forward and the council agreed. We reduced the assessment, not the rate. Not the rate. By, by 25%. <clears throat> well, now we have the same situation with housing. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have unprecedented historical relationships, un unprecedented monetary policy, unprecedented demographics, demand and supply, capitalization rate, access to capital, uh, Incomes relative to price and prices are way out of this. All this is historically unprecedented. So why wouldn't we use that same logic to say government shouldn't be benefiting because houses have still stayed way high, even though real purchasing power of families has fallen 9%. Why wouldn't we be making an adjustment for economic circumstances whenever the assessments for the book value for next year are being determined, why doesn't the methodology, because it takes into account income for commercial properties, mm -hmm. right? It does. It and does. They I have it benefited does. from that formula. Um, and, and they should, because they appreciated much less than, than houses. Mm -hmm. Houses is where the big money is, residents. But the logic that we use for car tax adjustments applies to homes. I agree. So, I mean, I just think it's, because I just, I'm just concerned not that we have the fixed cost of government, which we've got to fund, but people are, can't fund their own living standard without borrowing money, and that's not good. I mean, I just, we've got to be able, we got to find a balance, and I know you've been sensitive to that. I've appreciated your remarks. You've done a great job, and I say I agree with you on everything, but you have done your homework on why you think what you do, and, and I think that's appreciated. Is there another question from the audience, Robert? Yes, I have two. First one is, is the White Cliff Church uh, BMP or uh, ponding lake there? That's the conditional use yes. permit request. And it's in your district? Yes. And these folks want to know, how do you, where do you stand on that? So as I've stated, I haven't taken a, a position, uh, but I have stated I don't think it's wise to fill in ponds or waterways to build anything um, that someone's going to reside in. But ultimately, we have to look at the application, and I've, uh, I've consulted with our city attorney. Um, I think we have to be careful, especially with uh, private land use and, and ownership rights. Um, and so I think the Planning Commission took a position. It's coming before us. Um, but I am an advocate for, number one, community engagement. The people have spoken. It's clear um, this is important to, to that neighborhood. And ultimately, um, we have to make a decision um, coming up here in a few weeks as if we think this is wise in terms of uh, uh, the change and then the potential use, especially as we're looking at flooding <coughs> and, uh, and that referendum. But ultimately, I have not taken a, a yay or nay position, but I'm very supportive of what I've heard so far from the community. And I think we have a developer that uh, has acknowledged the people are concerned and my hope is that we'll be able to come together uh, and, and find a solution that pleases everyone, which doesn't happen often. Yep, and I, you are very wise to be consulting the city attorney. Another question is concerning the convention center hotel that's been bantered during the uh, retreat, and uh, why is there suddenly serpent raising its head again? So what is the serpent? The hotel. The hotel is the <laughs> serpent? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately... Uh, all of us have traveled to other large cities. You do need uh, a facility and a, a nice hotel uh, if you're going to attract who we that's say a, we want to attract. That's a big question. Do we want to attract or do but we want to get rid of the convention center? So that's the center question. Early. And My if we want to keep the convention center and attract these large groups, then ideally – they may want a better option than what we have right there at the convention center. I only request that you go <laughs> back and revisit when we turn this down during Mayor Sessom's term when oh. Bill DeSteff and Glenn Davis and I were all on council. That got, and even Lewis Jones, 
rejected because of all the rhetoric that we heard when we called the people for a fourth tier convention at best and what you have to give away to get something all you're really doing is subsidizing a profit and consuming uh, critical debt so that, that's a good history to go through we went through that once before and the so, sales pitch you know when you when you pushed away the bubbles you know there wasn't much water in the pan so for me on in the convention center hotel the issue um, that I've been vocal about is the way the process went um, and how we dealt with that uh, respondent um, when you talk about uh, and I know this is a buzzword but equity which proposal was uh, capstone okay um, I mean there was there were several there, there that was we a had scheduled presentation and so again I'll go back to the corporate sector just being respectful if someone is communicated with that they're they're welcome to come and do a presentation and I'd I traveled all across uh, the United States and there were some places uh, where you know we had a phone call and they didn't know Chris Taylor was six five African American guy when I showed up they hadn't never had a presentation from a six five African American guy and we didn't get too far that's but they were respectful the way we treated capstone by calling them on you know Good Friday and saying you're not welcome on Monday uh, I just don't think that's the way we should deal with people in business and so it wasn't about the actual convention center hotel. It was about when you have a commitment to bring someone to town to give a presentation that you've asked for, and then all of us out of nowhere, you tell them you're not, you're no longer welcome. Uh, that's going to cause a problem for us in terms of how we do business and how we're seen doing business. And that for me is very that. concerning. Yeah. You know, I would be asking, would you not say it here is who was involved in making the commitment and you know that's sometimes it's you know when you deal with 11 independent contractors <laughs> uh and someone says oh two people made a commitment but six people didn't make a commitment and the other five didn't know about it then feathers get ruffled and so now yeah. it's uh it's yeah. ugly so I, ultimately i think that's going to be uh that i made it a priority in terms of we all at the retreat got to list our priorities we need to make a decision um, if it's if we do an analysis and it, it's not going to change anything and it's going to require another hundred million dollars of taxpayers money it's probably not a wise idea but if we do have a world-class developer that wants to come to town and we have a plan and they're not asking for anything I, I think we should at least hear them out you know what I think would be great we never did this I never get it done but maybe you can is when the priorities are done they go out on the agenda and there's a formal vote mm. for their adoption and the public gets to comment but we've never done that because then you know they are the body's priorities by a vote because informal discussions is just that discussion absolutely <laughs> so, so i hope i, I answer that person's get question that. <laughs> uh, two comments that came in uh one was on the lake uh, by Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Uh, so far, right now, they said there's 4,600 petition signatures. That's a, that's a that's significant that's number. number. Yes. Yeah, very significant. The other one was the double tree. There's already a hotel there. There is a double tree there. Yeah. I'm not sure that's uh, to the level of convention center hotel that we're discussing. Uh, the double tree and speaking with their manager, they're very pleased with the business they're getting from the sports center. They're right there. Um, but again, think about if you are, we don't have any Fortune 100 companies here in Hampton Road or in Virginia Beach. I don't think no, so. None in, North, um, none, none in Hampton Road. Yeah, so <laughs> just think about if you're that convention planner and you're bringing your executives to town for HR conference or for any other conference and these individuals uh, are used to traveling to Charlotte, to you know Tampa, uh, to Houston, to Phoenix, and then we come here and their offering is Doubletree. Again, I was in the hospitality business. Doubletree is not a bad brand, Hilton, but that's not a convention center hotel. No, I think it all comes down to <clears throat> what do you have to give and what are these other places having to give and why does the hotel have to get a subsidy? And what's the opportunity cost of the capital allocation? Are you using land that you previously condemned mm -hmm. by Those the are public? All important. Yes. Oh, well, I think super what, majority what, vote is yeah, a big yes. is a big lift. In fact, it is, and I think all it comes down to is because we can't show a business case for Atlantic Park, we can't show a business case for any of You're these. Not supposed events. to say that out loud, John. But it's true. I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> so when people can't say, "Show me what 
goes into the unrestricted general fund and can I earn that amount of money doing something else that requires me not to spend as much of investment? That's what, Ultimately, if you're going to get into private business or a partner, then you gonna be like Warren Buffett. <laughs> you've got to be getting a, a competitive return, not just activity that puts money in other people's pocket, but at a cost but to your, the taxpayer and or use of debt. Mm -hmm. Even if they're paying for it, that's debt capacity that isn't going to build a rec center in a certain district and, and we get back to the root which is Correct. priorities yes and, i'm with and you. discussion and you know i applaud your <laughs> applaud you pushing for discussion and conscious choices that i i don't have to agree with your choice but conscious choices are preferred to uh blind choices mm -hmm. <laughs> yes robert these are just comments on we're never going to become a tampa las vegas and virginia beach needs to Quest to that, and then some of Mark Stoll said they go to the Cavalier, the Marriott Embassy, and they they just shuttle to the convention center. They want to be on the ocean front, and so that's uh, that's part of it. Uh, well, there I always has been that debate. Well, that, that that's a good that's a good point. Not uh, built on Mr. the ocean Dean front. Is, I brought this up to uh, a few individuals in private. Was when you look at the developments that have come the new hotels they have a large amount of convention space they do and we really haven't had the conversation of are they competing with our own convention center and i've been in some of these newer properties when these large conventions are here and i go why didn't they go to the convention center and that's a fair question but so if we continue adding inventory for convention space at the oceanfront that's newer and better condition uh, can offer more competitive rates than it is going to compete with our own uh, CVB. Uh, an insight, which, you know, if you look at the, I know one of the priorities is what to do with our remaining vacant land and assuming that between lots of issues that the green line is more or less maintained. Uh, and 85% of our tax base is residential. It grows faster than all the rest of the tax base and it hasn't changed since 1986. The mm. proportion has remained unchanged. Not likely to change going forward. It's too big a base. So then it says is, should our strategy be one of looking at our inventory of housing that's aged? And do we look at homestead exemptions? Do we look at other things that gives people who own their home uh, an incentive to redevelop that property so that when they depart or redevelop it and decide to sell, that we have a more competitive contemporary product in our aging neighborhoods to attract people to move here. We've, cause that really is where the money is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also a, um, a key variable in the affordable housing conversation is you take older stock communities where someone bought in the eighties or the nineties or the sixties and, and like that individuals <laughs> getting older and their child, they end up passing away. Their child doesn't want to stay in that house. They could sell it and they get that equity. So that's a different situation. Um, then you have the situation where you have some of those aging homes where they get behind. Uh, we just came out of COVID, you know, you had the, you know, relief with a lot of the mortgages, people didn't necessarily save, not saying they couldn't save or they could, but, they just didn't right and then they get in a situation where they're six months eight months nine months behind now they got to get caught up and that home goes into foreclosure and investors are coming in so i you know i bought my first home um at 22 out of wesleyan in a non uh, not very desirable neighborhood those homes uh which back in 2007 were selling for 180,000 uh townhomes uh, again not desirable um some crime in the neighborhood, but not, you know, not very, not dangerous, but some crime. Um, those homes are now selling for 230, 240,000. But the problem is investors are coming in and scooping them up at 190, 200, putting some money in and then either flipping them, which again, open, open market, or they realize that they can escalate the rents. And so now you, you take a $180,000 townhome that you got for 160 or you know 170 you put ten thousand dollars in and you list it for twenty two hundred dollars a month i mean that's a great turnaround on your dollar 
we can't fault those individuals. No, they're not uh, doing it now. They're but. not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I think this is a, a, a broader issue, yeah. and it's, it's something that if we don't take a look at and start coming up with policies, I don't think it's going to get any better, job. But I think when I talked, when I was working, <laughs> actively would talk to young lieutenant commanders with families and ask them where they were living. They disproportionately, rarely would you find someone that, if, unless they were stationed at Ocean Internet, would say Virginia Beach. They'd be Chesapeake, Isle of Wight. And I'd ask them why. And they said, well, we like neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods we like, we can't afford. There you go. And the ha neighborhoods we can afford are really dated. Mm -hmm. So my point being, since it's discretionary income that drives transactional revenue and drives other jobs, how do you make people that are in that home, that have been in that home for maybe they paid it off and they're not staying in the area, or whatever the reason is, but they see the advantage that under the right circumstance, rather than the developer buying a bull. And these are just, some of these are just small business owners, just I know. mom and pop shops. I know. I'm yep. talking about just the owner themselves yep. who live in their own home. Yeah. Would a homestead exemption citywide, would there be a way to provide tax relief to our lower income families? Because it's a constant dollar. Florida has uh, have homestead exemptions and that's, provides i just think we're gonna have to find ways to allow that people can afford to maintain their homes but doing it in a way that people that can't afford their homes you know get the homestead exemption too but they still got a higher valued property they're paying taxes but it does help the workforce people that might be able to use that fifty thousand bucks housing exemption like florida has for homestead if you, you know i just I think have, we're gonna have, have to look, look some, into that we're gonna have to look at some creative solutions that target the people Specific. we're trying to help but are uniform such that you're not being a subsidy. People tend to, you know, yep. you get 50000 on a $300,000 home. Isn't the same thing as 50000 on a million. It's not. <laughs> I have the last two, John. All righty, go for it. Uh, <clears throat> one is from uh, a Mrs. Howard. What is our return on investment for all these festivals when the revenues go to the tip and we keep raising our taxes? That question is, it remains to be un unanswered. Um, I think the challenge, again, we yeah, go back to culture, is you have a large portion of, uh, of uh, we'll just say stakeholders, that look at ROI as uh, the benefit to the resort community. And then you have other stakeholders that look at ROI as the return on that investment. And so... I'm not sure uh, I have an answer to the specific question, but I'll, I'll give you the, the, the festivals. There are a lot of residents that have enjoyed the beach, the bull riding at the beach and beach it and so on and so forth, and it's added to their experience, we'll say. And they're not thinking about the return on the dollar. They're thinking, I had a good time, and uh, I'll go on with my business. Then you have another group that, feels like they've been left out that they aren't their needs aren't being heard their voice isn't being heard and going okay well if we're gonna spend a dollar to get 35 cents back let's spend that dollar over here and so i haven't um i don't think we have a methodology that defines the roi for festivals for events uh maybe i shouldn't say that out loud but um but that's not something that's something we can work on Exactly. Um, and so, again, I'm not here to, you know, um, call anyone out. It's just this is another issue we have. And that was the concern with my last no vote was, do we really need this injection? Do we really need to spend this money? And believe it or not, John, there's emails that I've received that says, bring it, please. We need it. We want something oh. to do. And then there's some that say, are you crazy? <laughs> I, I'm sure that there are on both sides of the equation. And I think always the difficult part, as you know is each individual council member, now districts are not accountable to everyone, they're only accountable to their district, even though they have an obligation to everyone, they're not accountable to not everyone. Not accountable. They just owe the people their reasoning, and then people have to decide if they like the Warren Buffett test mm. or they like the emotional test, but, you know, but sometimes the people who pay have a different view than the people who get the benefit of what yes. someone else pays. But that's always a challenge in government. And I just think you share with people the thought process you bring. And I think that's the value of this show is to give you a chance to let people know how you come to issues and they don't have to agree. 
but they they should agree that you are thoughtful about the decisions you do come to, and that's all you could ask. That's fair. And Got one last one, thing? Yep. As from Mrs. Marsh, why are hotel assessments down? They are paying less tax at the resort than the Westin Hotel, and then the resort over in Gilgad, I guess she's referring to. Delta. Whatever the name of yeah. So Old when Har you look Old at yeah, when you look at um, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not. I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, similar to property, property values go up, taxes go up. Your tax rate may not go up, but your value goes up. I think what we're seeing in the resort community right now is you see room rates are going up, but not necessarily occupancy. So they may not be selling out as they were pre COVID on, you know, this weekend, but that rates 20 or $30 higher. And ultimately that's where we see the lag. And I, I you can correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think there's a, either a 12 month or 24 month lag. There's on a the lag commercial. Because, because of the one they can get their income tax return. But you may recall, you would recall this, but Robert <clears> would <throat> when Dr. Cook did his analysis and, you know, and talked about how, convention hotels and convention things were not good investments okay. for the taxpayer. He did that at great length. He's an expert witness to in mm. court cases. But he said is it's not just the gross revenue. It all gets down to the profitability. Now, the land is viewed on the land value, and it's not affected by how much money they earn. Mm -hmm. It's the improvements that are valued based on the profitability, not gross revenues. And so that's why the profitability of the hotels hasn't been as high, even though like income's gone up, but so your expenses and so Have your yet. profitability, your margin didn't grow, it probably shrank. And so that impacts, but you're right, there is a lag of at least a year between income statements. Yep. Well, that brings us to the close. Uh, this has been a wonderful hour and it just went by quickly, but as always, as I expected, you've done a great job. I've appreciated having you on your show. You've, you're representing District 8 well. Thank I you. I think people uh, should be very proud that they have a, a thoughtful, analytical rep that they might not always agree with, but I think you approach issues honest, and I think there's nothing that keeps you humble like your wife and kids. Yeah, well, I, my wife, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to share this with you, John, because uh, – uh, I had a council member uh, approach me a couple of weeks ago. They said my new nickname was Aaron Moss. <laughs> so for your crowd, they can, Aaron, uh, again, Aaron Rouse, uh, good, a teammate of mine at the First Colonial. And they said I was uh, a blend between Aaron and, and John. So I'm not sure the comparison, but I wanted to share that with you. I'm getting the heat. All right. Well, as we close out, <laughs> join us next Wednesday night, and you will hear from the city auditor. Lyndon Ramirez. And in the meantime, you can all go jump and watch Fox or Tucker Carlson or Netflix or go do something with your family that's more important. All right. All right you all take care. All right. Good night. Thanks, everyone, for watching. <laughs>